Welcome to the land of the down and out, where dreams have been dashed and lives have been lost. This is a place where no one wants to be, and yet, that is where the Book of Ruth starts. Bitter Naomi and friendly Ruth roll up to Bethlehem. Naomi has no money, no husband, no sons, no land. She isn't saying words like, glory to God for he is good, or hashtag bless. She tells them, I have lost everything and I'm bitter. And if you're honest, maybe you feel like her. And I welcome you here. Just because it looks hopeless, doesn't mean that all hope is lost. Things are going to change for Ruth and Naomi. They're heading into the harvest season, not just metaphorically or spiritually, but physically as well. Dear child of God, your story is not done. Like Ruth and Naomi, you may not see what is coming up, but hope is on the horizon. If you are not dead, then God is not done. Whether you are single, married, divorced, or widowed, you are wanted by your Redeemer. In the midst of utter hopelessness, can we fight for hope because their Redeemer lives? As we head into Bethlehem through the pages of scripture, I want you to discover your name in the midst of whatever your situation is. Not the name that was given to you at birth, but the name that God whispers over you at birth. Child of God, you are mine.
Good morning. If those beautiful voices sounded familiar, they should because they belong to some of our youth. Uh, Deborah and Catherine Thomas and Rachel Owen. Thank you, girls. That was beautiful music. And not only that, it was beautiful truth. Um, we are indeed God's flock, as you sang, and he surely does feed us. He is good and his mercy is forever sure. Thank you for reminding us of that. Now, I've decided that until this pandemic ends, I'm going to do each of my weekly sermons in a different place on this campus. I was thinking that way you won't forget what it looks like since we've been separated for so many weeks. Today, you can tell I'm speaking from in front of our kitchen here in the Rock Foyer, where we get such good physical food from Cheryl Burba and her crew on Wednesday nights. And I picked this as my, my pulpit for this week because my constant prayer is God will use the sermons to feed us and nourish us spiritually. Would you pray with me? Father God, feed us today with your written word so that we will each grow up a little more, each grow a little closer to our goal of being the fullness of Christ. Nurture our spirits, Father, such that we respond like him, think like him, act like him, love like him. Grow us, Father, so that everyone we meet can tell that we follow Jesus. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin with a question today. Have you ever noticed that when someone hears from the doctor that their life is about to end, they choose their, their words, their final words, very carefully? I mean, they want to make sure their loved ones understand the depth of their love for them, and they want to use their words to tell their loved ones important truth, guidance they're going to need in order to live when he has gone on to glory. I mean, most people don't exchange an idle prattle when they know that they're about to breathe their last. Now, this morning, we come to the end of our study of the book of Joshua, and it's where Joshua gives the Hebrew people his final words. But before we read them, I want to give you the setting. It's been about 23 years since Caleb marched off to those mountainous areas to conquer the fortified cities of Hebron. Remember when Bob preached about that? By now, the conquest of the Promised Land is pretty much over. Joshua is 110 years young, and knowing that you know he's about to pass from the scene, he gathers his leaders and, and the people together so they can hear his final words. Understand, Joshua has been serving these people for a long time now. He was Moses' assistant for 40 years, and he led the people himself for 25 years uh, as Moses' successor to cross the Jordan, conquer the promised land and settle there. So these parting words are precious words indeed because they come from the perspective of someone who has hung in there for the long haul, someone who has decades of accumulated wisdom gleaned from faithfully following God. Now we don't have time to read all of what Joshua said there at the end, but here's an excerpt from chapters 23 and 24. Open your Bibles and you can see where I'm reading. Beginning with verse 1 of 23. After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then old and well advanced in years, summoned all the, of Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Be very strong, be careful to obey all that is written in the book of law of, of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or the left. Fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the God your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Yes, thanks be to God. Now, Joshua's speech here boils down to one main statement. He was telling the Hebrew people, you guys have a choice to make. You can continue to serve God after I'm gone or not. It's, it's up to you. Now, Joshua, personally, he'd made this choice a long time ago. He decided that he would serve the Lord and he'd lived his long life accordingly. 
But now he knew his death was near. He would no longer be the leader of this nation, telling them what to do and when to worship, etc. From now on, they would have to choose who or what to follow. That was their choice on their own to make. And understand, Joshua knew these people. He probably knew them better than they knew themselves. He was leading Hebrews since before these Hebrews had been born. Decade after decade, he'd watched them grow and get, then grow up to the point where they were men and women fighting to conquer the land that God had promised them. And all his experience with these people, well, it told him they were wrestling with this choice he set before them. He knew they were wavering. They were wondering if they really needed God anymore now that this war was over and the land was conquered. So with his final words, Joshua confronted them with this choice to continue to follow God or not. Now with that in mind, I think our study of this text, well, it gives us a good chance to re-examine the depth of our commitment to follow the Lord, okay? So let's look at what it says and see what we can learn. First, Joshua says to the Hebrews, following God is a historical decision, a historical one. In other words, it's a commitment that's based on what God has done in the past. In verse 3, he says, You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God had done to all these nations for yourself, for your sake. Excuse me, for your sake. It was the Lord you got, your God who fought for you. And then in the next chapter, he leads them through kind of a condensed history lesson of God's actions for the Hebrew people in the past. He says, God freed you from the Egyptian bondage. God parted the Red Sea. He gave you victory over all the ites, the Jerichoites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, all of them. God says, you did not do it with your own sword, sword and bow. No, I gave you a land in which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. I did that. Then Joshua interjects and says, listen, guys, because of all this history, based on all that God has done, well, choose. You choose. Decide if in years to come you will feel the fear the Lord and serve him. I mean, Joshua was using some of his precious final words to remind them that this decision they had to make was really a no-brainer because continuing to follow God was the only, well, was the only choice that made sense when they considered all that God had done for them in the past. And you know, when it comes to our following God, the principle is the same. I mean, if anyone today has even a partial understanding of all the ways God has blessed us in the past, if they have any sense up here, well, they would indeed choose to keep on following God. Let's review our own personal history here. Look back at what God has done for you in your life. And if you're having any trouble, here's a hint. Joshua 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father who does not change. Well, look around your place of pandemic. See any good gifts lying around? Uh, sure you do. I mean, if God were to speak to us, he would say, I gave you that food you ate for breakfast this morning. I gave you the warm bed you slept in last night. I provided that home that you are now quarantined in. I gave you that closet full of clothes. I, I caused those spring flowers and trees out your window to bloom, and I made the birds that are singing so beautifully. I've been with you in the trials of the past, and I am with you in the trial of this pandemic. I've helped you through this tough time and all the tough times that came before it. And lest you forget my perfect gift to you, I gave you my own son, my only son. I sent him to die on the cross for your sin so that the, the barrier of sin between us could be removed and we could have fellowship together. I raised him on Easter morning so that death need no longer hurt you. You get my drift, Redlin? When we review our past, our history, we can see it really is a no-brainer to continue to follow God in the future. Second thing Joshua says to his people is this. He says that following God is an exclusive decision. In verses 6 through 8 of chapter 23, he says that in years to come, the Hebrew people must be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. And then listen to this next part. He says, without turning aside to the right or to the left. In other words, God was to have no competition. He was to be their sole guide 
in the decisions of life. Joshua emphasized this by saying that they were to cleave to the Lord. And the word cleave here means to hang on tight, uh, to stick like epoxy. You know, we all have pandemic time-filling jobs that we've done. And, and one of mine in these past weeks was to fix my hiking shoes. The, the toe rubber was separating a little bit from the top, a toe rubber from the leather. And so I got some gl Gorilla Glue and I squirted a bunch in there and I wrapped it tight with, with some blue rubber bands and, and left it a day or so. And, you know, not only did the toe rubber cleave to the leather, Part of the rubber band did too. I got this blue thing on my, my, my hiking boots. Doesn't bother me though. But the point is, I don't think it's ever going to separate again. Uh, it's cleaving real good. And I look forward to testing that in, in weeks ahead. The idea here is that following God is something we stick to like glue. We never let go of God to follow someone or something else. Joshua uses some of his last words to address this because he knew that idolatry was prevalent in the land and that it was beginning to have an influence on, on the Hebrew people. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of the Jews were, were strong in the faith like, like Joshua. They had given God their full allegiance and they were sticking to that decision. And then there were others who uh, had begun to embrace the pagan culture around them. They were already dabbling in the worship of foreign gods. They were beginning to live their lives according to the immoral practices of the culture around them. But in between these two groups, smaller groups, was the majority. And they had not made a clear decision yet uh, as to where they stood in relationship to God. And Joshua was saying, listen, you can worship the gods of Egypt. You can pick one of the plethora of false gods that are worshipped here. Or you can choose to follow the one true God, the God who made you into a people. His people, the God who brought you out of Egypt and gave you this land. But the point here I'm making with you, majority you Jews here, is it's time to quit straddling the fence. You have to choose. Remember, though, this is an exclusive choice. God will tolerate no idols. Well, let me ask you, Redland, what idols compete with the one true God in your life these pandemic days? And before you answer, let me remind you that idolatry doesn't necessarily mean bowing down to graven images. No, idolatry is moving God out of his rightful place in our day-to-day -day lives in the center and, and, and moving him away and then replacing that center with something or someone else. And I would remind you, God is a jealous God, or a more accurate translation is he is a zealous God. He is zealous for our complete devotion. In other words, as Joshua says, when it comes to choosing to serve him, it's all or nothing. God won't tolerate any polygamy following, you know. Well, what about it? Have you given your exclusive allegiance to God? Here's some questions to help with your answer. What preoccupies or rules your heart these days? What rules your thoughts? What takes up most of your time? What compels you, controls you, drives you, motivates you? To what does your heart cling? Cling, cleave like glue. What is it that gives you a sense of worth? What do family or close friends think might be idols in your life? You know, some might assume that we worship toilet paper these days. Just kidding. That last question, though, is a good one because the object of your worship shows. People will notice what it is that is first in your life. So what would they say? The point is, we can't follow God and something else. It's exclusive. It's all or it's nothing. Finally, Joshua says that following God is a personal decision. I mean, it's a choice that people have to make for themselves. This is what Joshua is getting at in verse 15 when he said, As for me, I am choosing to serve the Lord. What about you? You know, my dad once said, The Christian religion knows nothing about a proxy faith. And that has stuck with me. I mean, when it comes to the choice to accept Christ as Savior and then to spend your life serving Him as Lord central, you know, in your lives, no one can decide that for you. Your pastor can't, your deacon can't, your parents can't. It's your decision. You decide. You respond to God. No one does this for you by, by proxy. And speaking of parents, Joshua also reminds us as Christian parents that 
we have to decide whether or not we will follow God's instruction in Moses' book of law and teach our children about him. Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he's inferring, what about you and your house? Uh, if we read on, we would see that the people listening to those final words responded by saying, yes, of course, we will serve the Lord. And we're going to teach our children to do that. Joshua put up a memorial, a monument to remind them of that commitment. And I'm sure there were lots of amens. Yeah, we're going to teach our children about God, you know, uh, as he as he troweled in all that mud and, and stuff. But unfortunately, those same parents did not follow through with their commitment to teach their little ones. In the very next book of the Bible, in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. So those parents didn't follow through with that commitment. You know, the fact is, you and I are only one generation away from a culture that turns its back on our faith because all it takes is the failure of one generation of parents to tell their children about God. That's why I'm so thankful to hear our teens singing as they did this morning. Parents, this pandemic is a perfect opportunity. I mean, you have time and you're together with your family, which was rare before this pandemic hit. So take this opportunity to tell your little ones about your decision to follow Jesus and about what that's meant in your life as you've put God first. You know, sadly, there are many parents these days who say, I don't want to influence my child when it comes to religion. When they're old enough, they'll choose for themselves. And I find it strange, though, that they don't follow that philosophy in other important matters. They don't let their children decide when to go to bed or what to eat or what to wear. They don't let them decide if they're going to keep up with their schoolwork or not. They, they don't say, hey, I heard the kid next door has COVID. Uh, would you like to play with him? Your choice. Go over there if you want to. Well, why this inconsistency? Why give your child some guidance in life, but refuse to give them the most important guidance? And again, please don't misunderstand me. The final choice of faith is up to the child. But a child needs guidance and encouragement so that they can uh, be helped to make the right choice. Think of it this way. If children are allowed to grow up like weeds in a spiritual wilderness, chances are good that they will remain weeds when they do grow up. Another thing, you can be sure that your child does not grow up in a spiritual vacuum. If you don't teach them, someone else will. Listen to these words from not too far ago in history. The facts show that it is the family which is the main center of maintaining the religious spirit. We cannot and we shall not remain indifferent to the fate of children on whom their parents, fanatical believers, commit an act of spiritual violence. We're not indifferent to the fact that in the Soviet society, a family is a cell of communist education or a refuge of backwards conceptions, end quote. Now, those words were spoken in 1964 by one of Nikita Khrushchev's top deputies. Back then, the, the, the Russians, the communists, feared Christianity so much that they forcibly took children from believing parents. Even they were wise enough to know something that many Christian parents apparently ignore. The family is the key to passing on faith in Jesus. Well, let me ask you, moms and dads, what about it? Like Joshua, have you made the commitment to tell your kids all about the Lord that you love and follow so they can make a well-informed decision? If you have, would you sing your commitment with me? This is a familiar song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I want my kids to follow Jesus. I want my kids to follow Jesus. I want my kids to follow Jesus all of their lives, all of their lives. Though none go with us, we still will follow. Though none go with us, we still will follow. Though none go with us, we still will follow. No turning back, no turning back to the right or the left. Now, 
Say it with me. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See you this week in our daily devotionals.